great pleasure to introduce the second uh, speaker. And if um, Nicholas, as I call it, I think the, the godfather of drug delivery systems, I would say that Susie is probably the new star uh, on the scene. Uh, she is the Robert F. Rushmer Associate Professor of Bioengineering at the University of Washington. She's a recent PCASE uh, winner. Uh, and Susie's research is focused on delivery systems, so, but non-viral systems. So these are more engineered systems, so for delivery of drugs, molecular contrast agents, and uh, manipulation and discovery and transport processes in cells. So Susie. Hello, so it's um, a real uh, honor for me to be able to speak here with these uh, esteemed colleagues uh, sitting next to me. Um, so uh, as uh, Matt mentioned, um, our lab works on drug delivery. And so today, in this broad topic of engineering medicines, I'm going to talk about uh, delivery systems for um, large molecule therapeutics. So let me uh, start by clarifying a little bit what about, about what I mean. So the uh, small molecule therapeutics are most of the drugs that you uh, see on the market today. So these are, for example, the Claritins or the Tylenols or the aspirins that you might take. There are new classes of drugs coming out, uh, proteins that Nick talked about, nucleic acids and peptides. These uh, drugs are at least 10 times bigger in size than the small molecules. And so unlike the small molecules that can just diffuse into the cell after you uh, take them into the body, these large molecules really have to have a way to be delivered to their target. Uh, so I'll uh, focus my presentation on that topic today. I will talk about two classes of disease today. I'll start with uh, talking about cancer, and then I'll move into neurological diseases. Okay, so let's start with cancer. Um, as most of you know, cancer is broadly defined as a disease that occurs when some cells in your body start to grow uncontrollably. And I'll talk a little bit more um, in later slides about some of the genetic bases. Um, but in brief, you start off with cells. Uh, they start to undergo some changes. And eventually, um, after they start to grow uncontrollably, these uh, start to form tumors. And in some cases, these tumors will, these cells will actually start to even be able to migrate. And when that happens, you start to get metastatic cancer. Now, cancer has been around for a long time. And if you look in history, there's actually, there's actually documented records of how this was treated. So um, uh, if you go back to the law of the Babylonians, even back in, 19, in, the, uh, in 1750 BC, you'll see that the Code of Hammurabi actually talks about treatment of cancers. So in paragraph 215, it actually states that if a physician opened a tumor over the eye with an operating knife and saves the eye, he'll receive 10 shekels of money. And then a few paragraphs down, if a physician opened a tumor with an operating knife and cut out the eye, then his hands will be cut off. Now, I tried to look up what 10 shekels of money was worth. I don't know, but I can tell you that that risk um, uh, reward seems a little bit skewed to me. But in any case, um, surgical options still remains the primary form of treatment for many types of uh, cancer. For example, in breast cancer, generally, uh, the tumor will uh, be removed by surgery uh, first. And surgery really became a predominant form of treatment, especially after the mid-1800s after the mid um, 1800s, when general anesthesia uh, was invented. Uh, today, there are many forms of cancer treatment. There's hormone therapy, uh, bone marrow transplants, radiation therapy. Uh, but the type of treatment I want to focus on today are the chemotherapies. Now, the father of the idea of chemotherapy is um, Paul Ehrlich. Um, now, Dr. Ehrlich, when he was actually earning his PhD, was studying dyes, dyes that are used to stain tissues. And he noticed, uh, well, he was working with these dyes that would be used to stain specific types of tissues or specific types of cells. And so he made the connection that the, if there are chemicals that can stain specific types of cells, then there should also be a way to use chemicals to specifically target cells and kill them for therapies. And so that concept became known as the magic bullet concept, and he introduced this in the late 1800s. And in fact, just as an aside, he actually followed up not only on this principle, but he actually screened many drugs to find drugs that would specifically kill bacteria. And in doing so, he invented the first cure for syphilis. Now today, this concept has been extended to the idea of chemotherapy, where maybe there are drugs that can more specifically kill cancer cells and leave the normal human cells unaffected. 
So um, I want to give you some examples of some of the initial chemotherapeutics that were developed. In 1946, doctors Goodman and Gilman at Yale University uh, reported the first use of nitrogen mustard for treating lymphoma cancer. Um, and again, these were scientists who were studying the effects of mustard gas on soldiers. And they noticed that mustard gas caused these soldiers to have decreased white blood counts. And so they reasoned that maybe you could use this compound or similar compounds to treat lymphoma cancer. And that actually turned out to be the case. Another example is Sidney Farber, who was at Children's Hospital of Boston, treating childhood leukemia. He noticed that folic acid would actually increase the growth rate of leukemia cells in these patients. And so again, he thought, if there is an anti-metabolite to folic acid, so something that maybe blocks or competes with folic acid, maybe that would actually do the reverse. Maybe it would uh, prevent the growth of these leukemia cells. And so he uh, showed that a folic acid analog was actually able to be the first chemical used to show temporary remission of childhood leukemia. Um, I'll give you an example from industry. So in 1950s, Gertrude Alien and George Hitchens, working then at um, Burroughs Welcome, now GlaxoSmithKline, uh, started to develop drugs that would specifically inhibit DNA synthesis. And this was based on the observation, again, that in tumors, you had cells that were growing more rapidly than your normal cells. And so they tried to find analogs that would actually block DNA synthesis so that it would specifically stop the growth of these rapidly dividing cells. And some of these compounds are actually still used today uh, to treat leukemia. So these examples that I've given you of chemotherapy are using chemicals that can more specifically kill cancer cells. Um, so if we go back to this idea of the magic bullet, we'll see here in the red the target that we want to hit. We're hitting the target, but we're also hitting some other cells, right? Because there are still other cells that are dividing in the body, but that are healthy cells. And it's because of this that you actually see a lot of side effects uh, with most of these small molecule chemotherapy drugs. So let's go back to the genetic basis of cancer. So in the 1970s and 1980s, there was an explosion in understanding of um, molecular biology and the genetic basis of disease. And we now understand that uh, cancers arise because of a series of mutations in the cells that build up and eventually cause the cell to basically grow out of control. Now, Cancer is a very difficult disease to treat in part because the genetic mutations for each specific individual may be different. So even though one person may have a diagnosis of, for example, breast cancer, that the specific cause of that breast cancer may be different from person to person. Okay, so that actually introduces this concept then of personalized medicine that, that, Matt, O'Donnell, that Matt O'Donnell talked about in his introduction. And so the concept of um, personalized medicine is to take into account not only the diagnosis, so for example, cancer, but to also take into account the actual individual who has this disease. So when you diagnose this disease and when you treat this disease, um, you take into account the factors of that specific person and their specific circumstance. And in doing so, um, as the schematic shows up here, uh, you have your population of of patients, you analyze either their protein or their gene, um, and you can try to pick out subpopulations of people who, for example, may not respond to a prescribed therapy, may, pre may respond uh, exceedingly well to a prescribed therapy, or actually may have toxic responses to that therapy. Now using this information, you can more specifically and hopefully more effectively treat the patient pool. So I want to give you a few examples that I think are really exciting of how personalized medicine is already transforming the way we treat disease. The first example is actually uh, one of the few examples of having small molecules that are very targeted for the disease. Now, um, chronic myeloid leukemia is a form of cancer of the blood. Uh, a predominant uh, uh, percentage of people who suffer from chronic myeloid leukemia called CML um, have what is called a translocation of their chromosomes. So if you see up here, I have on the left uh, your, the typical 9 and 22 chromosomes. And a lot of people who suffer from CNL have what's called a transposition. So you'll see here on the second part, part of the 9 chromosome has gone to the 22 chromosome, and part of the 22 chromosome has gone to the 9 chromosome. Now what I want you to focus on is this, this uh, this mutated 22 chromosome, which actually has its own special name. It's called the Philadelphia chromosome. 
Now, when this translocation takes place, in the 22 chromosome, you actually have a new protein. You have the BCR protein of the original 22 that's been fused now with the ABL protein that was in the 9 chromosome. Now, the ABL protein is called a kinase. Uh, you don't have to know what that means, but this BCR able uh, fusion now is also a kinase, but it's a kinase that is very, very, very active. And as a result, those cells that have this mutation grow really rapidly, and that's actually the cause of the leukemia in these patients. Now, this was um, understood in, in the early 1980s. By 1984, the company that is now Novartis had already set up a program to screen for small molecules that would specifically inhi inhibit kinases. And their lead compound that they came up with is now known as Gleevec. So this molecule entered uh, uh, clinical trials in 1998. It was a small molecule that was found to very, very specifically bind to this BCR ABL kinase. And the results were so impressive that the FDA fast-tracked it for approval already in 2001. And so let me give you an idea of the impact that this molecule has made. Before the discovery of Gleevec, um, the expected outcome of a person who was diagnosed with CML was 15 months. And today it's over 15 years. And so that's the power of having a drug that so specifically binds to the molecular target that actually causes the disease. Okay, let me give you another example. Um, and this is out of the family of uh, therapeutics that uh, Dr. Peppas talked about earlier. Uh, these, these are antibody therapeutics. Antibodies are proteins that can bind to their specific targets. They're more complicated structures, but that also gives uh, the possibility for more specific um, actions. Um, I picked one particular antibody here. There are uh, several that are now out on the market. Um, this one actually is used to, to treat forms of uh, breast cancer. And so it was again discovered in the early 1980s during this explosion of genetic understanding of disease that particular forms of breast cancer would have upregulated HER2 proteins on their surface. And that the overexpression of this HER2 protein actually correlated with very aggressive forms of breast cancer. In 1990, Genentech uh, prepared the first humanized form of an antibody that binds specifically to this HER2 receptor. This drug, uh, approved in 1998, is now known as Herceptin. It is a frontline therapy for patients with breast cancer. And again, this is considered a personalized medicine because people with breast cancer can get screened to see if their particular type of breast cancer has the signature of increased uh, HER2 expression on their cells. Okay, so um, I want to move now to a new type or a, another type of uh, a therapeutic, the nucleic acid therapies. And so I talked to you about small molecule therapeutics, about protein therapeutics. Now the advantages of the nucleic acid therapies are first the possibility of actually targeting the genes that we now know are causing these diseases. Um, and another advantage is that instead of having to screen through millions of drugs to try to find a particular drug. Uh, using a nucleic acids, we already know which sequence would actually help to cure the disease. And so you might wonder, you might ask, what is the holdup? And the holdup, uh, one of the major holdups is actually it's really difficult to deliver these drugs. And so I'll, I'll spend the, the remainder of this talk uh, describing some of the technologies to deliver nucleic acid-based drugs. Now, there are two major classes of nucle nucleic acid-based drugs. The first are the gene therapies. Now, these are uh, complete gene sequences that, when they're delivered to cells, will result in the production of a new protein. Um, in the treatment of cancer, for example, you might want to give a protein that suppresses tumor growth. These are called tumor suppressor genes. And the other type of um, uh, therapy are small, uh, small sections of DNA or RNA that can actually uh, prevent pr protein production. An example of this are the siRNAs, small interfering RNAs, and I'll, I'll talk about an example of that uh, very shortly. Now again, I want to remind you that the concept of gene therapy is to go in and actually make changes at the DNA or RNA level to change the protein expression profile and really try to uh, change the, these uh, uh, proteins that, that are causing uh, the diseases. But again, the major limitation at this point is the way to really effectively deliver these large molecules. 
I want to give you one story of some advances in this area. Um, uh, Dr. Peppis mentioned Mark Davis in his talk, so uh, I had the privilege of working with Mark Davis uh, for my PhD when he uh, first started working on this project to develop materials that could help to treat cancer. Um, the materials that we ended up developing were based on a molecule called cyclodextrin. These are cyclic oligomers of sugars. Um, they form little bucket structures, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about these structures. But in short, what we did was we synthesized with um, Hector Gonzalez, a, a chemistry postdoc in the lab, uh, these linear polymers formed from cyclodextrins. Cycl cyclodextrins are really attractive materials because they're actually used in FDA-approved formulations um, as excipients for drug delivery. Now, these polymers are very biocompatible, and when they're mixed together with nucleic acids, they self-assemble together and they package the nucleic acids into these really small particles. And I've shown here an electron micrograph of one of these um, formulations. These particles are, again, really small. They're about 100 nanometers in size, and so they're in that class of nanoparticles that Dr. Peppas talked about. And in our initial studies, we show that these particles could deliver DNA to uh, some cells when we put them in culture. We then added on another component that allowed us to move this technology into animals and eventually into humans. Um, so I mentioned that cyclodextrins are molecules that are little cup-like structures. And an interesting point of cyclodextrins is they actually form inclusion compounds with hydrophobic molecules. So hydrophobic molecules will want to go in and sit inside that cup. So we use that as a technology to tether and to decorate the surface of these particles. So we would conjugate materials to these small hydrophobic compounds, and these um, conjugated materials would then go on and uh, sit inside these cups that are on the surface of the particles. And we could use this now to put in all kinds of different functionalities um, on these particles. So Mark started a company uh, to try to bring this work to the clinics. Um, and I joined that company uh, for the first three years of its existence. The, form the company now is known as Colando Pharmaceuticals, and this is a schematic of the technology that they're using. And you'll see that we have the cyclodextrin-based polymer. We have, they have two different modifiers that have the adamantane to modify the surface. And the modifiers um, impart the particles with properties for stability and then also for targeting so that the particles can go into specific types of cells, in this case, specific cancer cells. And then the fourth component is the siRNA, the nucleic acid that knocks down gene expression. And when these four components are combined together, they form a stabilized nanoparticle that delivers the siRNA drug. So Mark and Colando recently reported uh, their first human trial results um, in nature. And um, what they showed is that they took biopsies from three patients that were treated with increasing doses um, of these nanoparticles. And that's shown on the left here. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but the particles are shown in green on the left panel, and the cells are shown in blue. And they actually saw dose-dependent accumulation of materials in the tumor, so that as the dose was increased, they got more and more particles being accumulated in the tumor. And then they also showed um, a very specific effect on the um, expression of this uh, particular protein that they were targeting. So if they looked at the expression by mRNA or by protein analysis, they were able to see in all of their patients a reduction in this particular protein. And actually, I don't show the results here, but they were actually able to show how sequence-specific um, the, uh, the action of these materials were. So I actually um, left the company three years after it started. And one of the things that I started studying in my lab was the ability to deliver these nanoparticles with more efficiency. Now, one of the things we noticed um, in the original animal studies with these particles is that we were able to get material specifically to the tumor. And the tumor is shown here in green. This is a mouse model of cancer. And our particles are shown here in red. And so you'll see that we get material accumulating in the tumor, but that the, these particles, because of their size, are quite large, and they can't diffuse and penetrate into the tumor really well. And so in our lab at, at University of Washington, uh, we've been studying several approaches for increasing uh, penetration of materials into tumor. We've been able to optimize the particles of the, proper, of the particles themselves. Um, the other thing we've done is to immobilize proteins on our particles so that we can actually chew through the, the tumor as the particle is being de delivered. 
And then we've actually used a protein that's expressed in bacteria that actually helps to propel some bacteria as they're invading tissues. And so I'll show you a slide from this work. We were inspired by uh, some really nice movies from Julie Theriot's lab at Stanford, where she showed that this particular bacteria called Listeria is able to hijack the actin in uh, its host cell, polymerize the actin, and use this actin to push the, the uh, bacteria around. Not only can it move around inside the cell, but it actually can move from cell to cell. And that was very interesting to us. So we uh, purified this protein and we attached it onto our particles that we use for gene delivery. And so I'm showing here some movies of our particles now in cytoplasmic extract. And you'll see that our DNA cargo is shown here in red and the actin in the cytoplasm is shown in green. And you can see now that once we put this bacterial protein on, we can now have really increased transport of our particles uh, in the cell cytoplasm. So rather than just relying on diffusion, we now have a way of um, using the active transport properties that are inside the cell to promote delivery. Here's another example where we're using um, another particle based on lipids. And our particle is um, shown in blue, and the DNA is shown in red. And the actin tail, as you can see, is shown in green. And so we're flashing back and forth between the different channels of our microscope. And you can see that at the head here, we have our DNA in its particle that's being pushed along by this actin tail. So let me switch gears uh, for a few minutes and talk about some of the work we're doing to develop uh, gene delivery vectors so that we can try to treat neurodegenerative disease. Um, I became very interested in this because um, of the large need for delivering drugs to the central nervous system. Now, neurodegenerative diseases include Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's. The cost of care uh, for people with these diseases is over $100 billion per year in the United States alone. There is a real need for treatment because currently, although there are drugs available for treating these diseases, they really are um, drugs to manage the symptoms of the, disease, symptoms of the disease. There are no treatments available that actually stop or reverse the neurodegeneration. However, again, there are a lot of really exciting developments that um, help us to understand now the molecular mechanisms that underlie these diseases. And so the possibility is there for using gene therapies to try to treat these diseases. Now, we're particularly interested in a particular type of cell in the brain called the neuroprogenitor cells. Um, these cells reside in certain areas of your brain. Um, they're there with your neural stem cells. Um, and it's been shown that in healthy cells, you have one type of morphology for the growth of these cells. But that once you have neurodegeneration, uh, the, these, the growth of these cells uh, really changes. And there's a lot of literature on this that um, I'm not giving uh, due justice to, but I wanted to just summarize here that uh, there have been really good evidence to show that you can deliver um, growth factors to animal models of diseases, and if you deliver these growth factors to these types of cells, that it actually shows a lot of improvement in these animal models of diseases. And so the need for translating delivery of these factors into humans is, is quite large. And there are actually clinical trials using viral vectors to try to accomplish this. In our lab, we're trying to synthesize synthetic vectors. Um, there are a lot of potential advantages with synthetic vectors, including more biocompatibility, uh, less stimulation of the immune system, and potentially lower cost in developing these materials. So I'm showing up here on the left a schematic of a viral delivery vector. Um, viruses are natural pathogens that can deliver their DNA uh, into cells. They have specific proteins that allow them to be very, very efficient at this process. They have proteins that allow binding to the cell surface. These things are taken up into these vesicles called endosomes. They have other proteins that um, help the virus exit the endosome and then deliver their DNA into the nucleus. So when we started this project, we wanted to synthesize a synthetic material that would be very efficient. And that's very difficult because, as you can see here, it's a very sophisticated process. So we started off by trying to identify short peptide sequences that would mimic each one of these steps that the virus um, does. So for example, we wanted to have a peptide sequence that would allow us to recognize the cell surface, get taken up inside the cell, release from the endosomes, and then deliver DNA into the nucleus. So I want to share with you uh, uh, two of the peptides that, that we've shown to be very helpful in this process. 
The first peptide is called TET1. It's a short peptide that was identified by Nick um, Boulis' lab at uh, Emory. Um, they show that this peptide binds to this GT1B uh, that's expressed on neurons. And so we showed that this particular receptor, this GT1B receptor, co-localizes with the cells that we're interested in in that subventricular space, these neuroprogenitor cells. So we use this peptide to try to target those cells um, for, for delivery in animals. So we synthesized two um, nanoparticles, one that was unmodified, our control particles, and the second one that was modified with this peptide to help target these specific types of cells. We delivered these into the brain of mice. Um, and these panels show here the efficiency of gene delivery, where um, on our y-axis, we're delivering uh, a protein that's actually a firefly protein. So this is unnatural in humans or in, in any mammals. And so when this, pro when this gene is successfully delivered, we can actually see light production from these cells. Okay, so we use that to monitor the efficiency of delivery. And so you'll see here that um, we've divided up the brain into four sections. The ones that we're interested in are labeled L and R for the left and right cortex. And we'll see that once we put the targeting ligand on, we get a small but reproducible increase in the delivery efficiency of these particles. But the interesting thing comes when we actually look at the distribution of delivery in the brain. So uh, with our collaborator, Phil Horner, we did a lot of sectioning to see the types of cells that were actually being transfected in the brain. And so I want to point to you here, so the um, left um, column shows the stain that we're using for staining the different types of cells. And uh, the right column tells you the specific types of cells. And again, we're interested in delivering materials to the neuroprogenitor cells in the brain. And you can see here that if we don't have the targeting ligand on, we get about an equal distribution to many different types of cells in the brain. And surprisingly to us, once we put that small peptide on, 100% of the cells that uh, we deliver to are actually these neuroprogenitor cells. And so that's very encouraging to us. Now, I do want to point out that if you look in the slide, you'll see that our efficiencies of delivery are still really low. So we're just getting a few cells per section. And so we next worked on ways to increase delivery efficiency um, by trying to increase the release of these materials from these endosome structures. That's the next step that the virus, um, that the virus accomplishes. Now, Justin Haynes at uh, Johns Hopkins had already shown how important this step was for these synthetic systems. So he um, co-labeled uh, these vesicles along with different delivery systems, and he showed that adenovirus have very low co-localization because they're so efficient at getting out of these vesicles, but synthetic systems are largely trapped inside these vesicles. So one of my graduate students, Esther Kwan, screened through, synthesized and screened through a series of different peptides that we thought might be able to improve uh, release from these endosome structures. And she was able to show that one peptide that we call HGP uh, really helps to improve uh, release from these structures. So I want to show you one slide from her work. In this slide, she's labeled the vesicles in green, and our nanoparticles are labeled in red. And our control particles, particles you can see here, you just see a bunch of orange staining. That's because, as expected, everything is trapped inside these vesicles. Once she adds on this peptide, you'll see that the, um, that the colors have uh, separated. And so what you see is that the endosomes now are uh, green, so they're empty of the vector. And if you look at our particles, you'll see the diffuse red fluorescence in the back of the cell, which indicates that it's been released inside the cell. And so, of course, we tested the uh, delivery efficiency with this um, peptide, and we were able to show that this peptide increased both gene delivery efficiency and also siRNA delivery efficiency. So we were able to increase the efficiency of producing new proteins in the cell, as shown by this luciferase assay. So the gray bars show that the HGP modified material have much higher efficiency, about 20-fold higher efficiency than our control particles. And then also that siRNA um, efficiency is also much increased. So in siRNA, we're delivering nucleic acids that knock down expression of a protein. And we can see with the unmodified materials, we have a 50% knockdown. And once we put on this peptide, we get about an 80% knockdown. Um, and we also showed that these peptides can act synergistically. So we delivered to a neuron-like cell that's shown here on the left panel. And we show that if we have either one of these peptides, we increase gene delivery efficiency. But once we put both of the peptides on, we're able to further enhance delivery efficiencies. And so the last slide I'll show you is some new materials that we're making in our lab. 
If you'll think back to the materials that I showed you from the um, Colando work, it's a formulation with uh, four different components. Um, and what we wanted to do was to simplify um, our delivery system with these different peptides into one material that we could just combine uh, uh, with our drug. And so we have now been synthesizing materials that are uh, made by direct polymerization um, of our peptide materials into one material. Um, and we've actually designed this polymer so that it's biodegradable and, and so that it will be um, hopefully uh, more safe when it's used inside the animal. So I'll go ahead and conclude here. Um, our goal, of course, is to engineer these particles for delivery of nucleic acids that um, have the benefits of synthetic systems in terms of cost of scale up and uh, low immunogenicity, but that also are sophisticated enough to be efficient um, in delivering their cargo. So today I've touched upon um, the importance of new technology for delivery in realizing the promise of personalized medicines. Um, we need delivery technology so that we can have more specific delivery to the target cells, so that we can have more effective drug action, and also so that we can have the ability to reach new disease targets. Um, so I want to uh, finish by thanking the members of my lab who actually um, did all of this work, as well as our uh, collaborators, Phil Horner, uh, who worked with us very closely on the um, brain delivery studies, and uh, Peggy Olive at British, Cancer, um, British Columbia Cancer Research Center uh, for our collaboration with the tumor work. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. So I want to introduce uh, uh, two people who will be joining us on the panel, in addition to uh, Nicholas Pepys and uh, Susie Pun. Um, Dr. Bruce Montgomery uh, is here as the Senior Vice President of Respiratory Therapeutics at Gilead uh, Sciences. And Bruce has been instrumental in developing treatments for AIDS and cystic fibrosis. And I think it was, you said six? Is it six drugs that have gone through FDA process, or actually that are in uh, clinical use? Uh, joining us also is uh, Lonnie Adelheit, who is the former Senior Vice President of Research and Development at uh, GE. Uh, Lonnie's been in the medical uh, systems business for a long time and was um, uh, actually essential to developments of digital x-ray, uh, CT, and uh, advanced ultrasound. But I want to uh, uh, get this started. I'll start with three. And um, the first one uh, is based on what I heard at the talk yesterday from uh, Hugh Chang. And it was just, so he's the PATH guy that gave the great uh, keynote speech yesterday. And Hugh said something which I had not heard before, but it was very recently that worldwide deaths due to chronic disease passed deaths due to infectious disease. Okay, which is very, very interesting. I mean, the curves have been going uh, in the opposite directions for quite a long time, but now they've crossed. So, uh, and when we think about global health, and talk about global health, we usually talk in terms of infectious disease. Whereas now it's clear that the dominant uh, form of uh, death world, not only in the developed world, but worldwide is gonna be as a result of chronic disease. So uh, I'm gonna ask this to Lonnie, because I always ask Lonnie first, I always try to embarrass him, so he knows that. Yeah. Um, but does this change, this idea now that when we're looking at developing new technologies for healthcare, the concept that of a globalization, not a simple globalization in terms of infectious disease, but attacking the problems of chronic disease worldwide, does that change the way in which companies would be developing new healthcare uh, technologies, or would it still be that you're driving them mostly in the developed world and expecting that there'll be uh, ways to, to propagate down into the developing world? I have no clue, man. I know. That's your typical. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know, but I would think that medicines for the developing world is just going to be a separate class of things for a while. That, that's my own guess, that the, the big companies trying to make money are going to look at that and say, well, gee, is there an opportunity for me to make a very cheap CT or ultrasound scanner or something and say, or a drug? I think that's going to be a separate market. They'll go after it. They'll go after it with Chinese technology or Indian technology. But for the foreseeable future, I think there's so much health, so much money to be made in healthcare. 
uh, in the developed world that, that they'll stay focused on that. That would you be You still think guess. so? All right, let me give you one specific example in, in, uh, of this, because I heard a talk on this about a year ago, which is for a drug delivery technology, which is a very old drug delivery, which is the patch that you right. put on, um, uh, and the simplest cases for helping people to quit smoking. And it was pointed out that the number of male smokers in China and Indies exceeded the population of North America. And so there was this huge market uh, potential for that. Very small, but a huge market potential uh, for that. Well, I, I mean, I, there very well may be. But, but the question is, will the companies change and start doing research and development to, to, to try to go after that market? Right. I think it'll be separate. I, I, they may, if they see a good return on that investment. But I don't think it's going to, I think it'll be an additional thing, too, rather than a fundamental change in how people think about things. It's my guess. Okay. Uh, Bruce, do you think? A similar way? I mean, this is from medical device side and, and drug, but you've obviously been in pharma for a long time. So do you think well, that the, that same applies in the drug world? Well, if, if one, th just two parts to your question first. Are we going to see the transformation from acute illness to chronic illness? A hundred years ago in the United States, the most common cause of death was tuberculosis which today would be quite surprising to everybody here. But it, was the big, it was the big killer 100 years ago, and uh, we managed to get rid of it. Similarly, we will eventually get control of these infectious diseases uh, in third world countries. We will develop better TB drugs. We'll develop chronic therapies for HIV. But what we're going to see, and I actually I've been in third world hospitals, and interestingly enough, I'm always here looking at the infectious diseases, and they're saying, hey, we're getting patients like you guys got, like see, with people with chronic obstructive lung disease, heart attacks, and so forth. And they are clueless how to care for them because they've never seen them before because they don't live that long. And so I've, I, and it's like practicing in a Veterans Administration hospital in this country. You know, well, here's what you do. And so what we're going to see is the generic medica medications. One of the costs, <clears throat> one thing we know about where the money is going to come from is that we do know that about 80% of the drugs that we pay high prices for, by the time Obama finished his second term, he'll have reduced the prices by effectively 80% by generic drugs. It'd be a great promise to make. You could certainly hold to it. Because the cost of medications is going to fall. But even our generic drug costs are too expensive. For instance, my company, Gilead Sciences, makes the one pill, three medication, once a day therapy for HIV. I mean, clearly, the manufacturing costs of 59 cents a day doesn't work in Africa. And even though we sell in 99 countries at that price. So what we did is we teamed up with the Indian generic firms and said, we will give you your, our technology. You pay us a small royalty. If you can sell in those markets that we're selling at cost and make money, Godspeed to you. We signed up 10 Indian generic companies. So now the price is getting less than 20 cents a day. So what we're going to have to do is team up and use better production techniques and so forth. But as ge drugs go generic, they may still be too expensive for third world countries, and we have to drive the costs down. But once they're available, then if these countries can solve one of their key problems are, and HIV wasn't us not giving drugs, is not having an effective health care system to deliver the drugs, then I think things will get better. But I think what the control of the acute infections and all the other things, that development of that infrastructure, which is being encouraged by the global health, will then transition after we, after we cure those things, just like in this country, into, into more support of chronic health care. But we could also solve the problem somewhat by just decreasing our tobacco exports, but that's a different issue. Yes, that is a different issue. Yeah. Um, so for uh, Susie and Nicholas, actually I want to ask a different question if I go a slightly different direction. Um, so whenever I see presentations like uh, you did today, especially Susie, when you started showing some of the specific technologies is, I get really excited with this idea of uh, thinking about what you're doing from sort of an information processing point of view rather than a molecular point of view. So let's take, for example, what you're talking about, the delivery systems and then the gene therapy, direct gene therapy, and then the silencing therapies, which are really handling errors in code, right? And one's a direct trying to uh, uh, change the code, and the other one is the products of the code you silence by catalyzing them uh, into products. And so when we think about it this way, at least when I think about it this way, I say cancer is a piece of cake. I mean, 
we really should be able to do this. And uh, I said this yesterday at our little session over at uh, UW, is that of my generation of the 30 years, is that we've increased lifespan by 10 years, uh, just in the last 30 years in North America, mainly through the management of cardiovascular diseases. Um, can we, in the next 30 years, see a similar increase of 10 years or some number like that because we'll finally get at cancer? What do you think? It's your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, but as I said, when you see it up there, you know, and I know enough about the technologies to know some of the limitations, but when I see it, you get excited to say, do we really have this idea you know, of targeted therapeutics without the side effects that can, if not cure, at least manage uh, cancer to the level that can dramatically extend uh, quantity and quality of life, so. Uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, the question is, can we do it? Um, so the signs are there. Um, the, the National Cancer Institute has reported you know, for several years now that both the um, diagnosis of new cancers and also deaths from cancers have been decreasing every year. And in part, it's due to these new treatments that are available. Um, in my opinion, uh, the gene therapies uh, at this point still require that, that breakthrough technology that will allow it to be used for a broad range of cancers. Um, and I think if that breakthrough comes through, then yes, I think it's possible to see a, a, a big increase in these types of therapeutics for cancer. Is the, is the breakthrough in the delivery, uh, or is the breakthrough in the, I mean, the basic therapeutic, I think, is, has been demonstrated. So is That's it the right. delivery? That's right. It is, I, it is uh, in my opinion, the delivery. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so um, if we go back to the non-viral vectors, there's this question of uh, more efficient delivery and being able to get at um, solid tumors, these dense tumors. Um, with the viral vectors, we still have the problems of with cancers, you have to deliver these materials generally through the blood so it can get through and get to all the different uh, sites of metastases. And when you do that, you expose the virus right to your immune system. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. Right. Um, but, the, but the encouraging thing is that gene therapy has shown a lot of promise in very specific types of diseases. Um, so for example, there were great results recently reported for a type of congenital blindness where if you deliver the gene therapies to the eye of children, you can drastically improve their vision. And again, these are examples that show us the promise of these types of technology if we can overcome these major hurdles that uh, are present in a systemic injection into the blood. Right, okay. Uh, anybody play, I got one more or else I'm gonna have to start tap dancing. So uh, please, uh, folks, up to the microphones. I got one more question and then we'll um, open it up for uh, uh, discussion from the audience. Okay, so uh, Lee Hood, our buddy, who uh, is over in Israel, or else he would have been with us on the uh, panel right now, uh, and is Institute of Systems Biology here in um, Seattle, has been preaching for probably about a decade now this idea of P4 medicine, which is predictive, preventive, personalized, participatory, okay, which I think all of us would, um, what would buy into. So just open up to the panel, whoever wants to go. What's the big impediment? What's stopping this? I mean, I heard, Nick, uh, Nicholas, you were talking about uh, compliance. Uh, there were some other issues uh, about um, uh, predictive value. So, so where do you think is the, the major impediments to P4 becoming, uh, becoming reality? I think that Lee Hood has a, a great idea there. And I think three of the four Ps are a little bit more uh, easier to to, 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 to attain, to achieve than the fourth one. The personalized is the one that worries me. Uh, having a system that really adjusts to the specific needs of the specific patient. Um, I don't know if we are at the stage that we can do that. Even if we can do it, I don't know how it's going to be implemented by companies. But predictive, yes, I, I think there are the tools there for predictive medicine uh, what, 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 what were the others? Uh, they were uh, uh, preventive uh, and participatory. Per, per, yeah, participatory, of course. So you know, for me, the personalization is the, the difficult part. Let me, uh, uh, yeah. Like to comment is basically since I develop medications for whole classes of people, the concept that I'd have to develop a drug for each and every person when it takes me about ten years to get a drug developed struck me as being somewhat inefficient. 
and an impossible. And at eight hundred million dollars, I don't think I don't think that's the cost. However, <clears throat> I think things are changing, and occasionally something will pop out of the blue, which shows you the real possibility for it. Recently, uh, McCutcheon down at Duke identified in patients with hepatitis C, which are treated with interferons, which we've heard about. The, uh, they basically are equivalent of shake and bake, you know, and they, they don't make you feel good, so forth. And we have about a 60, 70 percent response rate in people, lower in blacks, lower in some other groups. And some groups it works great, some don't. And he identified one blood marker by doing huge screen of a population, which basically says if you've got this blood marker, you're going to respond 100% of the time, and your therapy can be maybe half or a third shorter. And then the other people aren't going to do very well. Well, that's kind of bad news for the other people. But for those people that can take that drug and you can apply it, it really enables you to do clinical trials faster because you know what your rates are. You know what group to do your new drugs in, the ones that don't work on that. And so you really focus it. So I don't think it's going to be personalized per se to the person, but I think as we understand these genomic markers, because we're doing whole genomic screens on people in clinical trials, we can really predict what your side effects are and what your response rates are, which then empowers physicians to choose. Now, that's, if you put personalized medicine in that category, I'm on board. If you say you're going to develop a medicine for, for this guy because he's got a big check, I don't think it's going to happen. Lonnie, and, and then I'll turn it over to the audience, is, uh, and we've talked about this a lot, the concept of molecular imaging within uh, personalized uh, medicine. Do you think, uh, number one, enabling technology, and how much is it going to make a difference uh, for this? Well, I mean, the imaging companies are betting a lot on it. I mean, they, they see that they see the, the uh, growth in MRI coming out of this personalized medicine kind of concept is going to just be huge for them. They're investing. GE bought uh, a pharmaceutical company for $7 billion just based on the idea that that was going to come. And basically, it, you know, you hear what Susie said, she's attaching all kinds of things. And if you could attach uh, something that an MRI can measure or see or an ultrasound machine could see or a PET scanner can see, you can now, instead of doing slides after you've killed the patient, or the, you, you can see that while in the patient, where that particular biomarker is going, is it working, uh, what, what can, you, can you zap it with ultrasound to make it penetrate faster? There's just all kinds of things going on where whereby imaging is going to have a huge impact on these things, and the companies are betting big, big on it. Yeah. So, Terrence, buddy. Yeah. Uh, hello. So, both Nick and Susie's talk were absolutely terrific, but one of the things that seems to be broken, particularly in, in Dig Pharma anyway, is, is um, uh, the, the pipeline of new drugs is drying up uh, in 2007. I think 80% of the class three uh, clinical uh, trials failed, and, and these companies put a billion dollars into each of those drugs. Uh, the whole model seems to be crumbling, and then, then that tied into the costs of, or the, the ability to, to pay for and deliver health care. Uh, Obama's new legislation may or may not help that. But the situation is usually complicated in a U.S. budget that is <coughs> greatly in debt. And then you look at the things that have made the, the most gigantic impacts in medicine. In 1880, August Semmelweis said, wash your hands before you do surgery. Right. That's probably had more impact on, on, on uh, um, uh, health than, than almost anything in medicine. And, and then just things like clean water and maybe eat broccoli to prevent cancer. So the first of Lee Hood's things, preventative, is very important. Right. Where's the business model for preventative? How, how can we um, develop that uh, I, I, and have huge impact, uh, maybe at a, a much uh, at, at, a cost, at a savings of cost to, that, to the society, to uh, society? So, Lonnie, actually, you had to hear yeah, I, I think what you're seeing from the talks and your question is that, that the system's broken. That, that's why you have all this in, incredible. Storm and drown going on between the left and the right and the up and the down over all this stuff. The fact is that eventually we're going to have to shift to a, a business model which talks about value. How do we improve quality? How do we increase the number of healthy years 
for something and at what cost. And as long as we don't worry about cost in the equation uh, or just sort of peripherally worry about it, it it's going to stay confusing until the system finally breaks completely and, th and then they'll have to do it, I think. I, I think, um, on the other hand, I think the thing you're talking the other piece of it, though, is I think there hasn't been that great big breakthrough that Susie talks about. You know, I think, and my own view is that over the next 30 years, given the rate of change of things, there will be three or four major breakthroughs which will change everything. And then you won't see a little fights between the FDA and business over which little product gets through or doesn't get through. You'll see rapid, rapid change, rapid development. And I, I'm optimistic just based on everything that's going on. Bruce? Yeah. Uh, the problem with the pharmaceutical industry, and, and, I'm, and I'm describing my own issue, I've, you know, a POGO, I met the enemy and is us, is really the reward systems that's out there for development of drugs. If you can develop a cancer medication and uh, that gives people alive another three or four months of maybe marginal care and charge a hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars for it you're going to be you're going to be very very wealthy and I think sooner or later we're going to wake up that that's not going to be sustainable as a model the so the matrices of why we develop drugs and so if they said there's a new rule out there the rule is the British have started with that is that you better have for every year that we're not going to pay more than $70,000 or 50,000 uh, British pounds unless you get a year of life out of that drug for the typical patient. Anything above that, uh, it's not on our bullets. If we establish that, that if we will pay, any, we'll pay fair price for any drug which decreases the cost of health care overall and improves the quality of life for the patient, and that's the rule, I suspect pharmaceutical companies would be looking would, would be doing a different choices and programs. I think that's where we're going to be, and kind of in the honor of Greg Getz, you've got to hit the puck where it's going to be. That's my matrices as I choose development. And I just recently got a drug approved, which is pretty expensive, but since it saves a fortune in hospital costs, getting reimbursement has been a piece of cake. You know, you say, well, you can don't take the drug and you pay twice as much of hospital costs. What do you want? And the insurance companies go, sign me up, coach. You know, so you can actually do that. So what we have to do is define what we want as a society and tell industry starting in 2020, because there's a long lead time here, whatever it is, 2020, these are the drugs we're going to pay for, and you can get money for that. And then we can get there. Right now, they, we're getting way too much money for very small things which are, yes, statistically significant, but maybe not clinically or socially important, and that's why we're broken. As I understand, um, the economics of drug development has tended to increasingly favor drugs over vaccines because since people take a drug continually as opposed to just taking a vaccine once, there's more money to be made from the drug companies. Is this really true, and if so, what can be done about it? Obviously, vaccines have a much greater potential for global and, and societal health. I think you should. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all about price. When I worked at Genentech, uh, the, the, the founder, Bob Swanson, came into my office one day and goes, vaccines suck. That was his comment. And it means it was... Did that go on the wall? Yeah, yeah. Up there it was. The and so we couldn't work on vaccines. And we came up with something called a hepatitis B vaccine. And someone else came up with it. And then someone came up with a novel concept. Flu vaccines were terrible economics when they cost 30 36 cents a dose. When it became $9 a dose, it became a pretty big business. Uh, right now, the cervical cancer vaccine, which costs a couple hundred bucks, is a huge business. So it's all about price. And uh, vaccines are highly effective. The new cancer vaccine is $93,000. I think people will sign up for that in terms of pharma economics, so in terms, in terms of making money. So it, the price point got to the point that it wasn't worth the risk. The government did something very good is it took the liability out and put it into a liability pool so companies didn't have to worry about creating massive liabilities. We had these huge scares that vaccines cause autism, led to all this enormous amount of litigation. 
That's been put behind us, and now you're seeing huge amounts of money being invested in vaccines. And I think you'll see cancer vaccines in the future given prophylactically before people get cancer to prevent it and so forth. So I think there's a huge future. And most major companies have huge efforts now on vaccines, where, say, 20 years ago, when the costs were so low, they weren't investing. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to quit, Derek.